Hello, and welcome to The Green Pill. I'm Kevin Wacky, and this is the podcast about public goods and regenerative crypto economics. I am here with Simona Pop, who is the founder of The Bounties Network, does community status and DAO engagement strategy at Gitcoin. I hope you enjoy this episode. So, you've got some money, but how are you going to use it? You want to spend. You, me, shopping, now, bro. When you know you should be saving. You'll never buy a house at this rate. But what if you could spend and save at the same time? For the enlightened kind, with inquiring minds, a new world awaits. Set yourself free with completely flexible, self-repaying loan technology. Supported on desktop and mobile, seize the power of Alchemix, allowing you to spend and save at the same time. Leverage your wealth without risk of liquidation. Take out a loan that repays itself. By using yield from your deposit to pay off your balance, your only debt is time. What was once inconceivable is now within your grasp. Are you winning some? If you're trying to grow and preserve your crypto wealth, optimizing your taxes is just as lucrative as trying to find the next hidden gem. Alto IRA can help you invest in crypto in tax advantage ways to help you preserve your hard earned money. Alto Crypto IRA lets you invest in more than 150 coins and tokens with all the same tax advantages of an IRA. They make it easy to fund your alternative IRA or crypto IRA via your 401k or by contributing directly from your bank account. There is no setup or account fees and it's all you need to do to invest in crypto tax tax-free. Let me repeat that again. You can invest in crypto tax-free. Diversify like the pros and trade without tax headaches. Open an Alto Crypto IRA to invest in crypto tax-free. Just go to altoira.com slash bankless. That's A-L-T-O-I-R-A dot com slash bankless and start investing in crypto today. Hello, Simona. How are you? Hello, Kevin. I'm good. How are you? How are Pretty you? good. Glad to have you here. Uh, so let's tee off by talking about how you got into crypto and what keeps you in crypto. Well, the how I got into crypto is a uh, shorter answer versus the what keeps me in crypto mm-hmm. <laughs> piece. Um, so I got interested in crypto back um, at the end of 2017 when I was doing a whole bunch of research around, um, you know, technology and really finance and where it could Mm -hmm. be taken to um, in a dynamic where it might serve more people than the current system. And so um, I stumbled upon a lot of um, articles around like supply chain and things that I believe Viant um, were doing at the time, um, who were part of consensus. Mm-hmm. And I kind of started digging a little bit deeper and um, trying to understand, okay, well, what are the real opportunities and real possibilities and real um, essentially trajectories that we can push this um, where it does indeed um, serve the many versus mm-hmm. yet again, the few. Right. And That's how I came to um, co-found the Bounties Network, met Mark. Um, We essentially discovered that, you know, we had this common interest in how we could use smart contracts to essentially deploy funds for anything, anywhere in the world, regardless of whether Mm -hmm. individuals who were completing bounties were their countries were part of the SWIFT network or even if they had bank accounts or not. Um, And that for me was a very interesting proposition, right? Because so many people are excluded um, from participation in the global economy and really just excluded from being able to, um, let's say, realize a higher Mm -hmm. potential, more potential because of their geographic uh, position and their socioeconomic status. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of that um, flipping that whole dynamic in its head and really this whole redesign of the opportunities to tap into resource that really Mm -hmm. captured my attention. And then from there, everything that we did and, everything, dare I say, that I continue to do is always Mm -hmm. with that in mind. How can we enable easier access, broader access? 
How can mm-hmm. we enable seats at the table for everybody? Uh, how do we create multiple tables that multiple people mm-hmm. can sit at? Um, and that kind of brings us to why, um, even though it is incredibly, incredibly taxing mm-hmm. energy wise, um, it's why like human energy wise, um, mm-hmm. it's why I kind of, uh, this is what keeps me in crypto because I genuinely believe that we can get those things done. And I genuinely believe in working until we get those done. Right. So. So you guys have done some interesting experiments with uh, the Bounties Network, uh, uh, the uh, things that were regenerative and quite frankly, before their time. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Bounties for the Ocean and some of the people that you met through the Bounties Network that uh, were able to earn a living and previously weren't able to before? I just like the social impact there, I think, is really interesting because it's very human. Uh, the human thriving that you created there was was there, can you just, can you tell me about that? Yeah. So with, um, and, and this is what I really wanted us to do with bounties. And like you say, we were so ahead of our time that people were mm. still looking at us going, wait, what, what are you, what do you want to do? Why are you doing this? Um, mm. so one of the main things that I really wanted us to experiment with is exactly this, right? It was the social impact side of things and to really go very broad in the application of bounties Mm -hmm. with the distinct purpose of distributing funds anywhere and for non-technical tasks, for non-technical endeavors. Because particularly when Mm -hmm. we did the bounties for the oceans in 2018, there was very little in terms of non-technical, um, you know, ways in to the Web3 ecosystem for mm-hmm. a great many people. And so one of my main desires was, okay, how do we create something so simple um, in terms of mechanism and in terms of task that anybody can can access it and perform that said task. This task was a cleanup. Uh, you prove that you have done a cleanup and you get rewarded with crypto. Now, mm-hmm. initially, we launched it in partnership with um, Maker uh, on World Ocean Day um, at the beginning or I think middle of 2018 and just put it up as a bounty. Um, we were rewarding, I believe, with uh, 10 die and it really took off to the point where we were getting submissions from people around the world for these cleanups that they were doing. We had people in Australia, in um, Romania, in all over the US, um, in, I honestly, in the UK, I can't even remember um, the full extent of the geographic reach, but mm-hmm. it was, it really took me by surprise because I genuinely didn't think there were that many people who would um, tap in and and start doing this. But as soon as we started getting these messages, essentially saying this was so helpful because it not only provided an onboarding opportunity, but really an opportunity to do something and earn crypto versus buying it. Let us remember it was 2018. So exchanges and on-ramps were few and far between. Um, even like compared to today, right? So it was incredibly heartening to discover this appetite for, for what we were doing. And it's one of the reasons why we created the pilot that we did later on in the year, in 2018, which was in the Philippines. The reason why we picked the Philippines was two, uh, well, there were two reasons. One, the Philippines is the third most polluted country in the world. And the second reason was we found a partner on the ground who could ensure the off-ramp. And so we partnered with somebody to make sure that if we were people uh, paying people with crypto, they could then uh, exchange it and turn it into Filipino peso. This was a very, very important consideration because I genuinely did not want to show up somewhere and just say, here's magic internet money. There's nothing you can do with it. Um, so we did this, this project in the Philippines across two days, 
um, and we cleaned um, this beach in Manila Bay. Now, what we discovered when we were scouting for a good location for a cleanup is this particular beach that was very close to a fisherman community. And we met this um, guy from that community on the beach on that day when we were scouting to see what the best kind of spot would be for us to um, to clean. Right. And he was burning some cables to get the copper out mm. um, of the plastic casing. And mm. so thankfully we had a translator with us and we asked him what he was doing. And he basically explained the whole dynamic that is plaguing that whole community and probably so many others like it that because Mm -hmm. the water is so polluted, there are no fish. If there are no fish, the fishermen have nothing to fish. Right. Therefore, the income dries out and then they have to find alternatives. Mm -hmm. Now, this is specifically and exactly one of the things Mm -hmm. that I wanted us to um, exemplify with this pilot and, and what we were doing in the Philippines is how can we diversify the means of income? How can we diversify the opportunities for people in the situation, in other similar situations, in any gradient of that situation to essentially tap into um, resource in another way? And right. so um, we um, worked with that fisherman community. We onboarded almost 200 fishermen onto mobile wallets in 2018. Mm. And wow. then we so ahead cleaned. of your time, mobile wallets. <laughs> so ahead of our time, yes, yeah. yes. And also, we hot spotted everybody on the beach. It was an intense, laborious, but incredibly rewarding, um, mm. incredibly rewarding exercise. Because one of the main things that we did, other than clean three point five, I think, tons of trash, and this was in four hours, two hours per day, mm. because then it gets too hot and we couldn't be on the beach. Um, we also unlocked this opportunity for people to understand the mechanism, have the tools in place, i.e. a wallet, and know where to go to do more bounties. And this is what a small yet very interesting percentage of that group of fishermen did. They went on to complete other bounties. And that was the main thing and the main takeaway for me is that you open up a door to alternative, to choice. You create that choice. People, as soon as you give uh, people the tools to do it, they will do it. And that didn't depend on any bank. It didn't depend on any charity. It didn't depend on any... uh, I don't know, international organization that has an office in that country that uh, costs, I don't know how many millions in Mm -hmm. admin and all of that. It was a a simple opportunity, a simple event and the tooling that is needed to then continue tapping into um, the, obviously the pool of opportunity that we're all building. Yeah. You know, it reminds me of that Charlie Munger quote, uh, show me the incentive and I'll show you, show you the outcome. So, you know, what I, <clears throat> the bounties for the ocean situation, it kind of seemed like, oh, uh, the water was polluted. And so all of these fishermen didn't have a way of earning an income. And so they had to burn trash in order to like, or find other ways of creating an income and they they had to burn trash, which probably further polluted the ocean. And then, you know, the cycle sort of continues as coordination failure. And then you like using Ethereum and mechanism design have this really elegant protocol for uh, if you do X, I will give you Y is basically the, the bounties protocol. And then uh, what you do is you go to all the fishermen and you say, if you clean up the trash on the beach, then I will give you tokens. And it sounds like you all cleaned up 3.5 tons of trash over the, that afternoon. 
And so I think that it's a really interesting example. If you show me the incentive, I'll show you the outcome. You basically shifted the shelling point of the incentives of all of those fishermen on the beach and created a regenerative outcome by using mechanism design. Is that more or less accurate? More or less. And mm. to be fair, I think it also dives into the intrinsic versus, versus extrinsic motivation or incentive. Because if you think about it, yes, they were getting tokens in exchange, but they were also cleaning the beach that they need for the fishing. Mm -hmm. Do you see what right. I mean? So then yeah. you have that double motivation to participate in something like this and the opportunities that this unlocks or rather the the possibilities of these permutations that it unlocks is just something that isn't necessarily i don't know whether it's not necessarily thought about in uh, the current models or it's just like everything is so cumbersome and so loaded with administrative layers that it's just impossible to be as flexible as that or mm -hmm. as um you know i guess prone to innovation as that right amazing so mm -hmm. you know i guess like the other thread that i want to pull on is that from reading some of your work and preparing for this interview uh the phrase human thriving has jumped out at me and that's something that you've been speaking about through the years and i'm i'm wondering if you know, how your experiences at Bounties and other places in the ecosystem has led you to pull on this thread of human thriving. Uh, can you tell us about that? Absolutely. So I think one of the main um, dynamics that we kind of see in, let's say, the Web2 world, or certainly the, the world as we've, uh, as many of us have experienced it for, I don't know, the past few decades or rather a lot longer than that has been this incredibly extractive, incredibly demanding with little reward um, play where we kind of come in and everything that we do is um, almost designed to extract every ounce of anything that we have to give. And again, mm -hmm. without that much back. And so I think it's one of the, the reasons why we see so many different um, imbalances. And when I say imbalance, I mean that across the board, right? Economic, social, geographical, all of that, because we haven't necessarily thought about what it means for a human to thrive. Mm -hmm. We've thought about living. Okay. What does a human need to live? Mm -hmm. um, what are the layers of that basic middle-class? Like we've uh, thought about all of these different boxes almost, but haven't ever focused on what an individual or what humanity in its totality needs mm. to be in a state of thriving right. and a lot of that comes from this um the experience not just my own but i think just speaking to so many people in so many different i guess situations or times in their lives or um i guess um space in their mind that mm -hmm. they always feel like there is something that they would want to do more of, but feel unable to because of some sort of constraint, whether it is, I cannot do this volunteer work because I have to work to pay my bills. Right. Or I would love to get involved in this, but again, the country that I'm in does not have X, Y connections with the global economy, or I live over here and I would love to work over here, but there's no mm. opportunity for me to do that. And so that just creates this imbalance and creates the stress that so many of us go through on like a variety of different planes of, uh, let's say, or, or um, areas of our lives. But I think one of the, the things that Web3 puts in play are the mechanisms to potentially at least take care of some of those, mm -hmm. right? And that for me is something that 
is incredibly, incredibly important and incredibly powerful because mm-hmm. you are shifting from a fully extractive way of being and having to behave in an extractive manner yourself because your whole environment is like that and shifting to this regenerative way of doing things where I put value in, I get value out. And it is like a butterfly that constantly moves this value up all around its wings and back into the body and over and over again versus a, uh, you know, one way I'm going to take from here and just mm-hmm. keep it. There's nothing going back to replace it. There is nothing going back to essentially ensure that that continues to provide value. Um, and so it's it's the main thing that um, I think for me is what I see in Web3. That is the promise that I see. And that is what everything that I tend to get involved with. And there's many things that I want to get involved with because I want so much to move and push this whole thing forward um, that I think it's, Yeah, it's it's very, I don't know, I want to say intoxicating, but it isn't that. It's just, it's very, um, I guess it's where the hope keeps, like the well of hope keeps like being at a certain level that enables me to continue doing what I'm doing. Right. So, so I guess, you know, what I heard was that the current financial system is not serving people. It's become this sort of extractive tool of the rich and the few to extract from the poor and the many. And what if we could build a more regenerative crypto economic system by hitting a reset on that and programming better incentives into the system using mechanism design or Ethereum or community culture? You know, I actually think that... um, Mechanism design is one thing that we're all very long on in the space, but uh, the creation of social norms in these communities and the selling points created around those I actually think is a really important part. Um, And how can that lead to more human thriving, not only in our local communities, but then exporting that to the world? Uh, Did I just say back to you what you said to me? Is there anything you would change about that? I think a big piece, though, um, and this is, again, something that that I um, tend to bring up in conversation is that there's a lot of unlearning that needs to happen because again, we've for generations have been programmed in the same extractive mindset. And I think it's important when, particularly when we talk about communities and particularly when we talk about these norms and particularly when we talk about evolving that and not recreating the same thing somewhere else, it's important to build mindfully. And I say this a lot and I mean it. Mm -hmm to, uh, you know, a a high degree. It is important to do it mindfully because I think we need to build with that thriving mindset whilst being in an extractive environment, right? Because right now with where most of us are with our feet in two boats, we've got, we still have to deal with like, you know, day-to-day life and every structure that we kind of encounter in that whilst building something completely new. And that is very, very hard because you're so deeply immersed in this extractive thing whilst trying to build something that is its opposite almost or so Mm -hmm. far from it that you it would, uh, you know, uh, stimulate human thriving versus, again, just maintaining that extractive um, dynamic. And so it is very um, difficult. And I think I've spoken about this, you know, in kernel and I've spoken about this just in, you know, either uh, group conversations or one-to-ones, it is important to unlearn a lot of the behaviors that we have just almost created into habits, which are, if I win, you lose. Mm -hmm. If I get ahead, that guy loses or is left behind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that that's like 
what's hard there is is the nuance that's involved in fr- running our whole financial lives on this on this old system that we've got a hundred years of cruft and you know probably some of those learnings are good and we want to transport over but some of them are not and then you have to live in both worlds mm-hmm. in, in order to have a toe into one of one of each and then you have to shift your center of gravity forward to the other you one almost you almost have to imagine literally being with one foot with one leg in two boats. Mm -hmm. What does that look like in terms of balance? It's going to be hard. Yeah. Yeah. So I think agility is key. Um, And then, you know, hopefully, hopefully for gen alpha and beyond, there's this regenerative crypto economic system that they can just sort of live in natively. And I'm wondering what that looks like and how to build that. If you could just solve that, actually, Simona, real quick, how do we build a whole web scale regenerative crypto economic system? You know what that brings to mind? It's just like that um, meme of the Draw it's the always the sunny. Album. Yeah. Like, yeah. no, it's always sunny in Philadelphia with all of the, um, oh, yeah, the red yeah, yeah. thread. Yes. Um, yeah, Char- Charlie will figure it out for us. I've like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I've given up smoking, though. So, like, that will not, um, I can't recreate that uh, perfectly, but. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I will say is it's incredibly important to bring as many perspectives into solving that as possible. And Mm -hmm. I think, again, that just brings me to a lot of the things that I tend to do um, other than, you know, those core, I guess, areas of focus that you mentioned um, for me right now, but just in the broader ecosystem, I, you know, I'm very, very involved in, creating opportunities for, or hopefully creating opportunities for new people to come into the space and hopefully creating pathways for them to do that versus the dynamic of, um, you know, here, like people come to the edge of web three and we're like, okay, see you in there. It's great, but you know, find your own way in. Um, I think it's important to create those those pathways, right? When you go into, like you go hiking, there's, you know, the beaten track. And then sometimes if you go off into like the wilderness, it's a little bit more difficult, right? There's going to be branches, there's going to be all sorts of crap that's in your way. And, you know, some people might turn back and not persevere. It's important for us to at least clear some sort of path or at least create some sort of way in so that people can then continue their own journey um, at their own pace, um, you know, with whatever it is that they're comfortable um, with the, uh, and get involved in whatever they resonate with, right. And value align with. And I think creating those opportunities is incredibly important again, for that perspective, for that plurality of perspective. I don't claim and I will never say that I can solve the whole thing because I can't. There's so much thinking that needs to come into play. There's so many blind spots that I myself have, let alone like everybody has blind spots. Everybody has the curse of knowledge. Everybody, uh, you know, has certain degrees of privilege. And it is important to get a multifaceted view of where we need to get to in order to get there. Because again, the same way as you have a flat map versus a 3D one, you can definitely see more and um, understand the ways around and the ways in and the ways through and the ways like, uh, you know, across Um, When you have that 3D model versus an incredibly, like, think of the old maps, right, that weren't even to scale when we were, like, just very crudely drawn versus something that is incredibly, incredibly, um, let's say, granular and incredibly nuanced. Because I think Mm. that is the way we build what we want with nuance. Right now, we don't have nuance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the word that I've been using for this is intersubjective consensus. So the combination of multiple people's subjective consensuses and or and skills is is how you kind of grasp the whole elephant of of mm-hmm. what we're building. When you shop for plane tickets, you probably use Kayak, Expedia, or Google to compare ticket prices. So why would you limit yourself to just one exchange when you trade crypto? 
When you make your trades, you wanna make sure you're getting the best possible price on your trade. And that's why you should be using Matcha. Matcha has smart order routing that splits your trade across all the various liquidity sources in Ethereum. And is also operational on Polygon, Avalanche, Binance Smart Chain, and other chains. Trading on Matcha is super easy because it pools the liquidity for me in a single easy to use platform and allows me to make limit on-chain orders. So you can set and forget your DeFi trades and they will go through automatically while you're away. So when you're making a trade, head over to matcha.xyz slash bankless and connect your wallet to start getting the best prices and most liquidity when you trade your crypto assets. Opolis is a member-owned digital employment cooperative offering payroll, health insurance, and membership perks that go beyond the basics that you would find at your normal 9 to 5. Opolis offers not only health benefits, but also pay stubs and W-2s, workers' comp, and unemployment insurance, as well as disability benefits for independent DAO workers that are traditionally reserved for regular employment situations. Opolis provides a tax-compliant way to get your paycheck in crypto and professionalize your work-life situation. Opolis members enjoy an average of 20 to 50% savings on top top-rated national group health insurances, as well as self-sovereign portable employment. You can also get tokenized rewards based on consumption, staking, and referrals, and also the ability to fund payroll in fiat and stablecoins without the use of centralized exchange. You can also receive paychecks in fiat and whitelisted digital currencies. So sign up for Opolis today and get 1,000 work and 1,000 bank tokens when you become a member of Opolis by May 25th, 2022, and get started working your self-sovereign life. Um, you know, I'm wondering what you're working on these days and if and how it, it sort of supports your work and in, in, in this vision. So with, um, with status, the, um, uh, the stuff that I put in motion and hopefully that is coming to fruition soon is a communities feature that essentially means that the whole status stack, which is very helpful and very useful, and it was built from scratch when they first started because there was no infrastructure, but it is very much uh, you know, in line with the principles of decentralization and privacy. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully that gets shipped this year. Um, and we have an alternative, like a true Web3 alternative to the community tooling that we use right now, which is Discord and a whole bunch of bots. Right, messaging. And then some, too. right. Yeah. And then some with the nice crypto uh, dynamics, voting in there and everything that we need. So that's one. Two is, and this is very much what I've started, what I started getting interested in last year is as DAOs have really evolved and obviously taken center stage, it's very important to also figure out those flows and do them right. Mm -hmm. And right now, and this is something that I guess is just a result of a lot of people being very early and a lot of people experimenting. There's a lot of DAOs with a lot of people doing multiple DAOs. Mm -hmm. but not necessarily doing them properly. And when I say doing them properly, I mean, it's a surface level of engagement. There is no depth where I would like to see the iceberg vibe, right? So Mm -hmm. this is the surface, but this is what is happening. And that bit is what I'm interested in figuring out is what the structure is. How do we make it something that isn't, you know, a stupidly bureaucratic and laborsome and cumbersome dynamic that just people don't have time for, which keeps us at that surface level and never going any deeper. And Mm -hmm. so I think figuring out what those flows are, figuring out how we're able to um, capture, distribute, and allocate attention in a way that flows versus Mm -hmm. in a way that is um, simplistic and lacking in substance is an incredibly broad endeavor, which is probably why I'm interested in it because I would really love to solve that. And I think, you know, with the work that uh, I'm doing with Gitcoin, bless you, Mm -hmm with the things that I'm doing with Gitcoin and exploring what those different governance engagement flows are, or even not even just governance, what are the flows through which we 
bring these human dynamics into a uh, pattern and into a relationship that actually does create something different and does create something that is uh, inclusive and participatory and transparent and efficient and effective and non-taxing. Um, mm. You know, it's it's a lot to figure out, but very interesting indeed. And I think some of the tooling that I'm working on, I hope will serve the broader ecosystem because mm. I, you know, and this isn't because I, you know, co-founded a standard, but I do like standards. I think mm. it's important mainly for facilitating a lot of the information uh, assimilation and uh, decision making. Mm. Like, it just makes sense, especially with the pace of crypto, especially with so many different things happening at the same time. It is humanly impossible to keep tabs and be involved equally in everything. It just cannot happen. And so right. figuring those dynamics out is is very interesting. And that is something that, that I'm working on and really, really um, interested in. And then the other piece, of course, is um, the uh, community aspect of it and the, uh, you know, creating space um, and creating spaces for people to join the community, for the community to grow stronger for the culture to be celebrated for the culture to evolve for mm -hmm. the principles to and the values to continuously be there um and i kind of tend to do that through um, a lot of the events that i create and co-create so liscon was a great example um shelling point i um curated the agenda um, mm -hmm. for shelling point um, and I think it's important to to continuously create those opportunities, particularly now where we're back to some IRL engagement, some ability to um, gather together in a physical space. And also, I think, um, maintain that culture, particularly the, um, you know, the culture that we all kind of, I think, fell in love with when. Um, we started on this crypto path because I think it is incredibly important and it does just keep us together and it keeps us together regardless of mm -hmm. the ups and downs and the, I don't know, yeah. law of crypto undulation that takes us on an emotional roller coaster every single day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, it is a very volatile space and there's a lot <laughs> moving uh, at many times and you and I have been through a bull and a bear together. Yes. Um, I'm curious, you know, like, so, so a, uh, this episode will probably air after shelling point, but hopefully everyone came, which was amazing. And it was great. Job. Yeah. And, and you've done such a great job curating that agenda and creating that space. Um, and I, and I'm wondering, you know, how we can sort of within Gitcoin DAO create that space that creates a depth of involvement. Um, I listen to a lot of uh, Sam Harris podcasts, and he talks about how nuance is the enemy of common understanding. And I'm wondering, you know, when we build these DAO governance structures, how do we build the the capacity for nuance and for understanding the uh, the depth of of our governance structures, and so we can solve these mechanisms and do it in a decentralized way that it's not just you and I top down making these decisions, but creating that inner subjective consensus, being the channel for the participants and it just feels like that paradox of nuance being the enemy of common understanding is the hard thing to design around. Do you have any, do you have any thoughts on that? So I think if you look at one of the things that I'm, and again, part of that human thriving dynamic is this idea of open source economies, right? Where everything is modular and everything, you know, the, the distinct blocks of, what make up an economy are readily available. The instructions for putting those together are readily available. Um, right. The, let's say the, the uh, again, the instructions are a little bit even easier than the Ikea situation, right? So it's very, very mm. easy to take the blocks. I think the nuance maybe is brought in by the different communities that employ them or take them and mm -hmm. put them together however it is that works for them. Mm 
The nuance comes from each community, but mm-hmm. the blocks are there to allow for the nuance. Right. So it's almost like you would, um, and again, just uh, taking the flat pack furniture thing um, as an example, it's like you have those pieces, mm-hmm. but you also have allow for the opportunity to paint it to maybe make something else out of those pieces. Mm -hmm. Even if you have everything and maybe you discard some, but you keep the main bits and then Mm -hmm. you paint it in 10,000 different colors versus like keeping it white or keeping it beige or keeping it whatever. Mm -hmm. But it allows for it. I think the moment you potentially sacrifice the possibility for nuance, the possibility for innovation, the possibility for even like, I guess, ways of using this that we cannot even think about right now. Mm -hmm. And putting barriers to that is just not wise. It's just a stupid thing to do. And I think that's where that's the, the tooling should be there allowing for nuance, but also allowing for efficiency, right? Because again, coming back to um, biomimicry, and I've spoken about that, um, when Mm. was it in 2020 at Shelling Point, which was sustained with three at that point. Um, Mm. In nature, you have this optimum window of viability, which Mm. is, and nature finds its way to this middle point naturally. Because, you know, that's what it does. So it's in, at the halfway point between diversity and efficiency. Mm-hmm. So it reaches that optimum window of viability where a an ecosystem thrives. A complex system thrives at that window. Now, what we tend to do us humans, and particularly the economy is a great example, we either have it too diverse which Mm -hmm. is like, you know, it's like collapsing because there's so much happening or too efficient. And this Mm -hmm. is where we go in with restrictions, with austerity, with all of that to strip it way back down from way over here, missing the middle completely, and you go Mm -hmm. in the other extreme. There is never that opportunity to get to the balance point, which is technically where that human thriving would happen. You either go way too far or way too far this way, way too far this way. Mm -hmm. And that is something that, again, we need to be very mindful of when we create the rules, when we create the systems, when we create the contracts, when we create everything that we create, don't push too far either side. Right. Because the good stuff is in the middle. And as we know, Mm -hmm. just anything, right? Get through the shell, it's in the middle. That's yeah. what's in the middle. It reminds me of the, the Buddha quote about finding the middle path. And we have to make I mean, it's true. Like, however way you slice it and whatever philosophy and whatever, um, you know, I guess, uh, discipline you look at, particularly, again, when we talk about nature or when we talk about philosophy and things like that, it is that. It is that balance. Mm-hmm. And the you know, the tricky bit is knowing when you're there and maybe discovering how to get there. Right. So that's what I'm doing. What are you doing? <laughs> Trying to spread the meme of regenerative crypto economics. <laughs> and thank you for uh, riding shotgun with me for 45 minutes. Um, we are coming up on time. Is there anything I didn't ask that you want to tell us, Simona? Um, what didn't you ask? I think maybe um, a good kind of... Um, I don't know, a good way of um, looking at everything. And this is just a a little bit of advice because I've definitely been through these moments. And I know that so many of us, particularly who have been in this ecosystem for a while, have gone through at different times. It, it, It tends to be very intense and it tends to be very exhausting, particularly when it is a constant mm-hmm. roller coaster of emotion and roller coaster of everything that it brings with it. I think finding that 
piece that motivates you to keep going and motivates Mm -hmm. you to essentially like keep going and keep going and keep building. I think if human thriving is something that you're, you're aligned with, I think keep that in mind. It's, an incredibly Mm -hmm. um, all-encompassing and also an incredibly generous way of looking at things. And I think this is the stage that we need to enter in where we are generous, not just with ourselves, but with everybody else. And I Mm -hmm. think looking at things from a generous perspective and wanting to create a, um, you know, a, a, a system or a world where generosity is, um, you know, the, let's say the motivator versus extraction. Um, I, I, for me, I find that that, that keeps the, I don't know, the carrot, I guess, mm-hmm. the infinite carrot that keeps me right. Going. Yeah. That seems like the right balance. Um, mm. well, this is really, this is inspiring stuff. Simona, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Uh, where can people find you online? find you and your work twitter is probably the best um i also put together a link tree just to remind myself of all of the things that i do because i also tend to forget sometimes um so it's just at sim underscore pop and you can find everything there all right thanks so much simona thank you thanks for having me